Yo, what is up guys? It's me, Zach Lee. All right, so now I'm not quite sure what to believe. At first, I thought all the Lakers talk about them not being sold on Lonzo Ball with the number two overall pick was just smokescreen to try and make sure the Celtics don't pick him. But then I thought to myself and came to the conclusion that I don't think that is the case since if we the fans picked up on it and thought it was a smoke screen, then the Celtics front office will for sure be able to get the same idea. And also, I just don't see Markel Fultz not going number one overall in this year's draft despite any tricks the Lakers might try to pull. I just don't. But then I also thought, if that's not the case, could it really be that they're simply just not that interested in Lonzo Ball as we all thought they were? Like Lonzo Ball to the Lakers. You can almost just see it happening. You say it and it just sounds right. But another report has come out that points in the direction of the Lakers selecting someone other than Lonzo with the number two overall pick. As the report came out yesterday claiming that the Lakers are considering trading the number two pick to the Suns or the Kings. Here's exactly what Chad Ford of ESPN reported. The Lakers held internal discussions about trading back two spots to number four. If the Suns were to offer them a 2018 first round pick, the Lakers believe that Ball or Jackson might be available at the number four spot. If not, the Lakers are still very high on De'Aaron Fox and Jason Tatum and believe that securing an additional prospect might be worth dropping two spots in the draft. So basically, they're looking at Ball or Jackson. Those would be their first two picks. If not those two, then they also said they like Fox and Tatum a lot as well. And I just made a video a couple of days ago which talked about how impressed the Lakers were with Josh Jackson and that after the workout with him he canceled his workout with the Boston Celtics so there was already speculation that the Lakers promised to select him if he was still on the board which actually makes this very interesting because a Phoenix radio host also tweeted on Monday that Josh Jackson has been promised by a team in the top three and that was right after the Lakers workout and at the time the Lakers were the only team that had met with Josh Jackson. Which leads us to this trade scenario, and it is an interesting trade scenario, but at the same time, it seems like a gamble from the Lakers. Look, if they really want Jackson or a ball, and it seems like they're leading towards Jackson right now, trading down to the number four or the number five pick could be very risky if they want to get either of those players. As for Sacramento, I don't see this one as likely, but it will probably be for a package of the fifth and the 10th pick. And I just wanna mention that, I really, really hope the Lakers and the Suns pull off that draft day trade because while I can see Lonzo playing in LA, the team I want him to play for the most, the team I think he'll be the best for would be the Phoenix Suns. To me, Phoenix and Lonzo are like a match made in freaking heaven. Phoenix is a team that likes to play at a really fast pace, up and down the court as fast as possible. And as we've seen from Lonzo at Chino Hills and at UCLA, he excels at playing at a pace similar to that. And also seeing a backcourt of Lonzo and Booker, that would be dope. And on top of that, seeing Lonzo throw lobs to Marquise Chris, a young player who I think is really being overlooked and I like his game, that would be dope too. But the thing is, if the Lakers call the Suns about trading down in the draft, you have to assume that they're probably not looking to select Lonzo Ball with their pick. And if the Celtics already drafted Fultz and the Lakers are looking to take Josh Jackson, the only thing in your way from getting Ball with the number four pick is Philly. And even though they have a reputation for just as selecting the best player available, even if they already have players at that position, I don't think they would select Lonzo in this year's draft. See, this is the deepest draft there has been in a long time. And the best player available when you have the number three pick is kind of hard to do since at least three other guys on the board could all be considered the best player available. And some of those guys bring skill sets to the team that you don't yet have, as opposed to Lonzo, where I don't think he and Ben Simmons could coexist on the same team since they're both playmakers who need the ball in their hands, which is also why Philly has been looking to trade down to Sacramento as well, since either Malik Monk or Jason Tatum, two of the three guys they are projected to draft, would most likely still be available. And as for the Kings, we all know they want De'Aaron Fox, so even if they do get the third pick from Philly, I think they take him over ball. So back to Phoenix. If you don't accept the trade, there is a chance that Lonzo is still available to you at number four. If you do though, you take the safe route and you automatically get him, but you have to give up your 2018 first round pick as well. So to recap this whole mess, because it is a lot that could go down, try and stay with me here. Uh, the Sixers and the Kings basically 
are the wild cards that could mess everybody up. It's clear what teams want who at this point with the Celtics and Fultz, the Lakers and Jackson. You know, they prefer not to take him at number two, but I think they will if they have to. And the Sixers, who knows who they are looking to draft at number three. I know they prefer to trade down to number five, but if they have to stick at number three, they could select just about anyone. But let's say for a second here, the Sixers and the Kings do trade, then everybody gets who they want. But the Kings might not want to trade up since Fox could very well be on the board at number five unless their escape Phoenix will take him at number four. But like I said, if they do, then Sacramento takes Fox at three, the Suns get ball at four, and Philly gets like Tatum or Monk probably at five. In this situation, everybody gets who they want, possibly. If the Lakers and Suns trade though, the Suns for sure get what they want in ball, but the Lakers will most likely miss out on Josh Jackson at number four if the Sixers and Kings do not do their trades, since I predict the Sixers will most likely take Josh Jackson at number three if the Kings don't want to trade. So the key to this all is, if you are the Lakers, is to convince the Kings that if Lonzo and Jackson are both gone at number four, that you are going to take De'Aaron Fox. And that will kind of force them to do the trade with the Sixers. See, if the Lakers can do that, trade down to number four and get the guy they probably would have taken with the number two pick according to reports anyways and on top of that land a 2018 first rounder from the phoenix suns they will be the biggest winners of this year's draft before yesterday there were only two teams in which people were considering chris paul to go to this summer either staying with the clippers or going to the spurs however the number of teams has now doubled however the number of teams has now doubled as paul is not only set to meet with the clippers and the spurs but the nuggets and the rockets as well and for the rockets see this is interesting because gm daryl morey just went on record to say that the rockets will be looking to take risks in order to beat the warriors and that he has something up his sleeve to do so and it looks like that something could be signing Chris Paul. But in order to sign CP3, like the Spurs, the Rockets would also have to make some cuts since they don't have much money going into the summer. First off, they'd have to let guys that just turned to free agents like Nene Hilario go. And then they'd have to trade someone like Ryan Anderson and get basically nothing in return. After both those moves, the Rockets would have about $23 million in cap space available to them. And if they can clear up another 7 million, which shouldn't be too hard to do, then CP3 could very well join the Houston Rockets this summer. And signing with the Rockets might not be as safe as signing with the Spurs, since we all know the Spurs and Chris Paul would be a great fit. But if the goal is to win a ring, safe might not be the way to go. See, nobody knows how good Paul and Harden could be together. And for the Rockets, that would have to basically be their whole pitch. They would have to go to Chris Paul and say, look, with you, we would have arguably the two best playmakers in the NBA on our team. That is enough offensive firepower to help us keep up or maybe even surpass the Golden State Warriors. And that would have to be their whole pitch. As for the Nuggets, you know, they almost landed Dwayne Wade last year as well. So you can't count them out as a free agent destination. And overall, they are an interesting team. They have an up and coming superstar in Nikola Jokic. Jamal Murray showed last year that he could be a great scorer in this league. You know, you got some hardworking guys off the bench like Gary Harris and Kenneth Fareed. And on top of that, they have plenty of cap space. As it stands, they wouldn't have to give up a single person in order to tie in Chris Paul. They're about $28 million under the cap space and that's not including luxury tax either so if they bring in cp3 then all of a sudden they have a couple of great playmakers as well fill up the rest of the roster with shooters and you got a pretty legit looking team normally even though i don't really respect kevin durant's move i still agree with some of the things that he said sometimes he makes sense but this most definitely was not one of those times as during his exit interview for the year kevin durant Kevin Durant said that the Golden State Warriors are not a super team. First of all, if everybody wanted Steph, he would have been the number one pick. A lot of people passed on him. A lot of people doubted Steph, saying he wasn't going to be this good. Klay Thompson, he was just supposed to be this okay shooter in the league. Like, that's what you thought of Klay Thompson when he came in. Draymond, nobody wanted him. He was a 6'5 power forward. They said he couldn't play in the league. He couldn't start in the NBA. Sean Livingston had a crazy knee injury. Nobody wanted him. Nobody thought that he would get back to being Sean Livingston. Andre Iguodala, he got traded a couple of times. Nobody wanted him. 
a lot of people didn't expect to see these guys where they are today. Super team, no. We just work extremely well together. Coach puts us in a position to maximize our strengths. Uh, I don't even have to say much about this. I don't know if he was still under the influence or what, but this was just about some of the most ridiculous stuff I have heard all year. I mean, if KD doesn't think this Warriors team is a super team, then it scares me to imagine what an actual super team is to him. Also about the whole draft thing he was mentioning, everybody knows that it doesn't matter when you were drafted. With that logic, a team of Kwame Brown, Anthony Bennett, Michael Olawakande, Greg Oden, and Andre Bargnani would be considered more of a super team than the Warriors, since they were all number one draft picks. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And KD, I know he's celebrating, but put the bottle down. And that is going to lead us to the question of the day. And no, it's not going to be, are the Warriors our super team? Because that's not even a question. So here is today's question. Clippers, Rockets, Spurs, or Nuggets? What's the best situation for Chris Paul and why? Let me know down in the comment section below. But now let's take a look at what you guys said in yesterday's video. And yesterday, after Kevin Durant said Kyrie Irving is better than Allen Iverson, and reports came out talking about the possibility of LeBron leaving the Cavs in 2018, I asked you guys how you felt about both things, and here's what you said. AI can carry a team Kyrie can't. Argument over. Iverson carried the team offensively. The only thing Kyrie does better is that he goes to practice, hence his shooting. Question of the day. AI 2K rating, 93. Kyrie Irving 2K rating, 89. Numbers don't lie. Not too many people talked about LeBron leaving, probably because none of us can actually envision him actually leaving again. But just about everyone agreed that I I Iverson is still better than Kyrie Irving. Like I said though, don't forget to leave your answer for today's question of the day down in the comment section below. But other than that, thank you once again guys for watching the video. Hope you guys enjoy. If you did, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more daily NBA videos. And until tomorrow, keep getting the bugs team SCC, and I'm out of here. Peace!